Battery Generation. Brought to you by Celeste. Welcome back to Battery Generation, your podcast on electromobility and European battery research. Leonard, good to see you again. Good to see you too, Patrick. Well, we've been reading a lot of headlines on sustainable new cell chemistries recently. And many of these announcements come directly from battery companies that plan to build cells with alternative green materials like magnesium, calcium, zinc or aluminum. And every time I read these announcements, I wonder whether these new materials can actually replace lithium ion batteries one day. So today we have the chance to speak to one of the leading experts in Europe on multivalent batteries. We'll try to explain that in a while. But first of all, welcome to Battery Generation, Professor Rosa Palacin. Thank you for inviting me. Let me introduce you to our audience really quickly. You are a Spanish battery materials researcher, a professor at the Institute of Material Science of Barcelona. You are a member of the Alistor ERI Network of Excellence, the president of the International Battery Association and a member of the governing board for Batteries Europe. So once more, welcome to our podcast show. Thank you. You have a very new um approach to battery technologies. Why are you researching these new materials to begin with? Well, the, the first idea is that if we're going to need batteries uh, beyond portable electronics and transportation for grid applications, uh, so we will need a lot of batteries and very big batteries. So we will need a lot of resources. And uh, lithium is not really abundant on Earth. So when you look at the really the most abundant uh, electropositive element on Earth, uh, there is uh, sodium, there is calcium. So uh, the, those elements are appealing. And one of the advantages of uh, magnesium or calcium, for instance, is that uh, the charge of the ions they form is plus two and not plus one as for sodium or for lithium, which means that to compensate each ion which is moving inside the battery, instead of one electron, we could have two. So uh, this is interesting. And if we could use uh, these uh, metals as negative electrodes, we could also have very high energy density for the batteries. Maybe the power will be lower because the, those ions are double charged and move slowly, but uh, I think it's worth to, to, to give it a try. Could that translate as easily as saying, um, if I have two electrons which I can move, I have the double capacity? Pretty much, or is it not that easy to, to imagine? Just as a broad estimation. Yeah, well, in principle, yes. The only thing is that uh, though this ion is intercalated uh, or is reacting with the electrode material. So you need an electrode material which also allows this, which has these empty sides uh, to give it all this amount of ions or batteries. This could also be translated into one material instead of reacting with uh, two lithium atoms, we'd react with one magnesium atom, and that's the, the thing, and the, the capacity will be the same. So it's maybe this is a too simplistic analogy, So, but this could be true if your material is not limited uh, with respect to the numbers of or the number of ions or electrons with which it, it can react, at least in this range that we are talking about. Let's get our uh, non-scientists here uh, started. Um, there is a very popular graphic um, within battery research. It shows the um, elements of lithium, of sodium, of magnesium, calcium, zinc, and aluminum. And it pretty much shows uh, the gravimetric and volumetric energy density plus the abundance. And that looks actually really promising if you believe into new battery materials. So could you uh, briefly um, once more explain to our audience what is gravimetric and volumetric energy density and why do these new materials, why do they look very promising on the paper in theory? Yeah, the, this graph that you mentioned is related to the metals. So they refer to the, to the use of metals as electrodes. So nothing compares to lithium gravimetrically because lithium is very light. So for lithium, you can uh, react one mole of lithium ions and one mole of electrons, so to say. So this gives you the gravimetric, so the, the number of electrons per mass of lithium. Lithium is not very dense, which means that volumetrically, 
the number is not that impressive. So gravimetric means per unit of mass and volumetrically means per unit of volume. So lithium can react with one mole of electrons, sodium as well, but sodium is heavier. Uh, so um, then the gravimetric values are not that interesting. And the advantage of the other metals is that they can react with two or even three moles of electrons. So with one mole of uh, ions, you can get two or three moles of electrons. And this gravimetrically means per gram of metal and volumetrically can be per uh, um, cube centimeter of, of metal. And this is comparing uh, the metals when used as, as electrodes. So for the moment, lithium has some issues to be used as, as uh, electrode material, and we use graphite mostly in lithium ion batteries. So the capacity either gravimetrically or volumetrically for graphite are not uh, that interesting. So if we can improve the values of graphite and use sustainable abundant metals, this is really interesting at least to try. We'll uh, in a bit talk about the energy density performance, all the different factors, charging, for example, and stability, lifespan and safety and all these kind of things for the different multivalent batteries that are in specific once more. That is magnesium, calcium, that is aluminum and zinc. But first of all, to get all of our audience uh, into this podcast, uh, Professor Palacin, could you once more uh, tell us How are um, lithium ion batteries built? And is there a huge difference to these multivalent batteries? Yeah, lithium ion batteries uh, uh, involve the movement of lithium ions from one electrode to the other. There is no lithium metal. So there is uh, uh, the positive and negative electrodes which react with lithium at different potentials. And the cell voltage is the difference between those two potentials. So what you have is that you have uh, electrons that move outside the, the battery via the circuit, and we use these, these electrons as the current the, to power our uh, devices. And inside the battery, to compensate this charge, you have ions. So when you change to multivalent batteries, the advantage is that uh, you, you do not exactly mimic this system, so you don't have electrodes which react with those multivalent ions, but that you have One of, one, one of the electrodes is the metal itself. So uh, this will give intrinsically higher energy density. The rest can be rather similar, at least for, for, uh, for calcium, magnesium, and aluminum. Zinc is a little bit different because uh, zinc batteries can work in aqueous medium. So lithium ion batteries use organic solvents as the electrolyte because at those low uh, voltage that uh, the negative electrode has, you would get hydrogen. Uh, if you had water uh, in the electrolyte, you would, you would do the electrolysis of water and get the hydrogen on the negative electrode. So you cannot use water. You're forced to use other solvents. But for zinc, you can still use water. But uh, so this it makes the, the difference. For zinc, you can try both. And for uh, magnesium or calcium, you need to use organic electrolytes pretty much as, as lithium ion. But then one of the electrodes would be the metal. Dear audience, you can now see how different issues already these different materials bring uh, with them. Uh, Professor Palacin, let's talk about the electrolyte at the interface, at the uh, electrode uh, interface there. Uh, I hear from time to time that ion mobility is an issue with all of these um, battery materials. Could you describe that a bit? Yeah, the, the, this is the issue. The main uh, bottleneck with multivalent batteries is that those ions, uh, which we can, we can imagine as one sphere, which is moving inside the electrode and then from the electrode to the electrolyte and then to the other electrode. For lithium or sodium, the charge is plus one. So they have a certain mobility. For those uh, ions that have a, a larger charge, they will have interactions with the surrounding. The, these Coulombic interactions makes them move more slowly in principle. So this is why uh, we can not expect very high power for these batteries is one, if one day they become a practical viability because the, the double charge makes them move more slowly. 
And so uh, the, the, the migration of the ions in the electrode, from the electrode to the electrolyte, and so it, it's always a, a problem. So I guess performance is something that I shouldn't ask right now, since that is still in research. But again, in theory, um, when uh, multivalent batteries uh, have different uh, valency, um, is quick charging probably at some point an issue? Yeah, definitely. I mean, the advantage uh, of those batteries would be the capacity, the energy, but not the uh, but not the power. So they will they would not be able to give the energy very fast or receive the energy very fast. So either quick charging or quick discharging will likely be an issue when compared for lithium or sodium. For the performance, we can uh, calculate some values, but we need to, to do a lot of assumptions to do this. So, uh, of course, then uh, you, you get uh, values which have a certain incertitude. But uh, if one could use the metal as an electrode, Easily, we would get the same performance as the lithium-ion batteries uh, can have today. And of course, one of the uh, um, things to bear in mind is that then for the technology to be fully sustainable, we would need to use positive electrodes, which are also sustainable. So we should not use cobalt as a, as a metal in the positive electrode. So we, you, we would need to use electrodes based on iron or on manganese, which are abundant and, and so on. So the the sustainability of the technologies of the whole battery. So uh, this is also something to, to be considered. Let's stick to that topic, sustainability. Um, would you say that this is um, one of the main promises that this uh, new material could bring, that we have abundant and sustainable battery technology on the horizon? Yeah, absolutely. The thing is that uh, now we are thinking of uh, batteries to power not only portable electronics, which, which are widespread, but finally it's small batteries, uh, one cell or, or a few cells connected for, for laptops, etc. We are talking about uh, cars, which are uh, batteries in the kilowatt hour, and, uh, and then uh, we move to, to the grid application. We are talking about mega instead of kilo scale, which is much bigger. And if we are going to deploy these everywhere in the world, we will need a lot of cells and a lot of materials. So then we better use materials which are abundant and accessible to many countries, not geolocalized, the things that then can bring geopolitical issues. And if they are abundant, they are likely cheap. And so uh, calcium uh, is really a very abundant element. So if a battery technology could work, then of course it could not be used for all applications, but it's if it could cover, for instance, grid applications, then it would be uh, really uh, interesting. So we, we should not use lithium for everything. One sketchy issue is always safety uh, with lith lithium-ion batteries. How does that look uh, with multivalent batteries? Um, I think that we we shouldn't expect many intrinsic advantages with respect to safety because finally the potential at which uh, those uh, electrodes would work would be similar than the one for lithium-ion batteries. So we, we would need to take more or less the same precautions in the case of magnesium, the potential of magnesium is slightly higher. This means that the energy density of the battery would be likely lower, the cell voltage would be lower, but then one can think of increased safety. Magnesium is not uh, really as reactive as, as uh, lithium or sodium or calcium. And for the case of zinc, if we're using Echo's uh, batteries, then uh, as long as we stay in the range of stability of water and we do not produce any hydrogen, uh, then of course one could think of, of uh, safer cells and also of more simple uh, assembly uh, protocols because you don't need to assemble the whole battery in absence of, of water, uh, which is an issue, which is expensive and needs de defined protocols and so on. Let's now jump then into the details of the uh, single cell chemistries. Just before that, um, we have heard magnesium, we have heard uh, aluminum, zinc, and calcium. Which one of these four cell chemistries is the most promising material and why? Well, it's difficult to say uh, because there are different criteria that you can think of. So 
Some people would say zinc because zinc is already used in primary batteries, but they, they are not rechargeable. So we need to learn to make the zinc electrode rechargeable, which is far from, from being trivial, but some people would say zinc because there is already know-how. Other people would say that the calcium, because of the low potential of the calcium electrode, which would give high cell voltage. And maybe other people would say uh, aluminum. But in this case, really, the chemistry is very different because uh, I was pointing that the fact that the ions are have a charge 2 plus makes them difficult to move. If it's 3 plus, it's almost impossible. So finally, aluminum batteries do involve the movement of other ions, not aluminum 3 plus. So they are maybe more complex. So I would say maybe if I had to bet on, on zinc and calcium. Okay, then start with uh, zinc batteries. You just um, told us we know zinc batteries already from zinc air and, and zinc carbon batteries. These are primary cells, and you said uh, it's now an issue to make them rechargeable. But uh, couldn't battery research benefit from these um, uh, prior zinc chemistries in order to now develop a rechargeable one? Yeah, indeed. I mean, uh, zinc carbon is, uh, in fact, a zinc uh, manganese uh, oxide batteries. So uh, there is a lot of research uh, in trying to make these reactions uh, um, reversible. And there is some progress in the field. So uh, this is, I think, uh, one of the ways to go. Then with respect to zinc air, there is the issue that the air electrode is really complicated. I mean, you need to, uh, one, one of the reactions is the one that you have in fuel cells, so oxygen going to oxide ion, but then you need catalysts to make this reversible. There has been a lot of, of efforts also on the lithium air chemistry, sodium air, but the air electrode is really a pain in the neck. So uh, I think that uh, it would be better to learn from, from the zinc alkaline batteries and see whether uh, one can make it rechargeable. And um, one, I mean, the, the issue is not only the positive electrode, the manganese oxide electrode, but also the zinc, that the fact that when you dissolve and uh, re-precipitate zinc and you oxidize and reduce, the, the surface is not really very smooth. So the, this, I think uh, a lot of progress in fundamental electrochemistry and ele electrodeposition would, would help here, yeah. We have heard about uh, water being used as electrolyte, um, so that's very promising from a sustainability point of view. Um, but now let's skip to um, calcium batteries and the electrolyte. That is one of your research focus, actually. So how far are you there in, in research? Yeah, the, the issue with calcium batteries is that we do, we do not have any standards. So for the lithium ion battery technology, if we are working on the positive electrode, we would use standard electrolytes or standard counter electrodes to test. But there are no standards in these new technologies. So we are somehow optimizing everything at the same time. And it's very difficult because we, we need finally to define some protocols to test the new materials against something which is known. So um, the, the uh, electrolytes that we work with are similar to those used in the lithium ion battery field, just because these organic solvents are very stable with respect to oxidation and reduction and can dissolve uh, lithium salts to make electrolytes with good ionic uh, conductivity. And the issue, again, is related to the fact that calcium ions have a 2 plus charge, which means that they would attract the negative ions in the electrolyte and form ionic pairs. And this will make more difficult the mobility of, of calcium ions through the electrolyte. But we are, we are yeah, working on it and, and see how to improve it. It's great that you put that up again because um, you mentioned before already that the the moving speed of the ions is, is, is one of the main issues. And uh, just to understand it, is that something that you could change by having some new electrolyte material that offers better um, transportation? <laughs> yeah, indeed. There, there are uh, issues. Uh, so if one could, uh, for instance, block the negative ions in the electrolyte so that they are not moving or are not interacting with the positive uh, electrode. So 
at the beginning, I was thinking that maybe polymeric electrolytes would be more complex, but some people think, and there are interesting results, that polymeric electrolytes in which only the positive ions are mobile could be an option as well. So uh, there is really, I mean, the technology is in a very low level of development. So all uh, ideas, uh, as crazy as they may seem, are welcome to 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 test new concepts because uh, we are uh, we are addressing fundamental challenges. So uh, yeah, anything new is worth considering. I I can see that that this is like a multi-dimensional puzzle as you as you described before. You have you have so many parameters that you are optimizing at the same time. Yeah, I imagine this is very exciting, but also very maybe confusing at times. Or <laughs> Yeah, or frustrating. I mean, sometimes the, the, the students, when they start and nothing works, and uh, yeah, it, it can be frustrating. That's true. But also when something works, then you're really happy. So. Let's now skip to uh, magnesium batteries. Um, really um, stupid question here. When researching magnesium batteries, uh, researchers sometimes tell you, don't use the term magnesium ion batteries. Why is that? Yeah, so the issue, this comes back to the term lithium ion. So uh, if you, um, an interesting red is the, the um, Uh, description of the Nobel Prize in Chemistry 2019 to the lithium-ion battery because the, the information uh, given makes very clear the distinction between lithium and lithium-ion battery. So a lithium battery, in principle, should be the one using lithium metal as one of the electrodes and another compound as a positive electrode. But then this was giving safety problems. So lithium uh, metal is not used. Now we are using graphite. So those are lithium ion batteries, which do not have any lithium metal in the electrode, just lithium ions moving from one side to the other. So then if we keep this analogy, we should talk about calcium batteries or magnesium batteries if we are using the metal as, as electrode or zinc batteries. And we should only talk about magnesium ions if we are using, imagine, graphite, which is not the case, but and another compound as positive electrode. So the, normally the term ion means that there is no metal electrode, if we are rigorous in the wording, which I think we should be. Could you uh, just describe for magnesium batteries then uh, what is or what are both uh, materials on the electrodes then? Yeah, yeah. For, for the negative electrode, uh, the aim is to use magnesium metal. And then as positive electrodes, this is really uh, tricky because uh, the proof of concept for this technology was given in uh, 2000 by uh, the group of Professor uh, Doron Auerbach in Israel. And they were using a, a, a molybdenum uh, sulfide as positive electrode, and they demonstrated a lot of cycles but the cells had a relatively low voltage. And since then, a lot of people have been trying to, to improve uh, this, and it's complicated. So there is some success with sulfur as a as positive electrode, despite the cells again, still have low voltage. There is some success with uh, organic uh, compounds, and there is research going on in Germany and in Slovenia, very successful. But then with uh, compounds containing transition metals, similar to those uh, used in the lithium ion field, uh, it's complicated. It's not trivial. Okay. But could you give us a, a glimpse of how stable these batteries are for now? How many cycles are we talking? Yeah, these batteries, I mean, we can think about many cycles as long as we limit the voltage and we limit the capacity. So when we want to have higher capacity and higher voltage, then we get into trouble because the electrolytes that are known to, to promote the magnesium plating and stripping, so this oxidation and reduction, which we were discussing uh, in an efficient manner, are not compatible with high potential cathodes and are very corrosive. So this is part of this multidimensional space that is not yet fully optimized. So we do not have... Uh, Uh, optimize components for the three uh, battery elements, which would give very uh, uh, attractive figures of merit for the moment. But it's true also that uh, 
the lithium-ion battery uh, concept has been in development for a long time and a lot of efforts have been devoted to it. So maybe it's still, we, we, we hope to, to improve uh, it in the future, but we've been going on with it for a while and it's not uh, trivial. All right, then let's skip to the last one. It is aluminum ion batteries. Um, you have displayed the abundance of as really, really great. Uh, plus the volumetric density of aluminum is outstanding. How is the state of research going on with aluminum then? In aluminum, there is less research than than in the other concepts because, as I, as I was saying, it's really even more tricky because you will not be able to move aluminum plus three ions freely. They will interact with anything in the surroundings. So the most su successful concept to date is using aluminum metal as the negative electrode, so oxidizing and reducing aluminum. But at the positive electrode, they use graphite. And the ion, which is intercalated and deintercalated in graphite, is not uh, aluminum. In fact, it's uh, an ion with negative charge from the electrolyte. So the mechanism is really, uh, is really much more complex. And uh, it makes more tricky to determine which are the reactions. When you see some electrochemical performance, to, to know where the electrons are coming is not trivial. So it's even a, a, a more tough topic. But of course, there is research going on. So we're basically talking about a potential next generation of batteries that could be a lot more sustainable, a lot more abundant. But we are still at a very early stage. As, as we've heard, if you would use your future glass ball and look into the future, how many years we are still away from this technology, what would you estimate? Well, it's difficult to bet on something, but uh, I would say that maybe for zinc, it could be shorter term, but maybe it's uh, eight to 10 years. And if we're talking magnesium or calcium, maybe 15 and aluminum even longer, because we need uh, to first uh, have the reliable proof of concept at the laboratory level for a complete cell, which works smoothly and then we need to upscale the technology which is not trivial either so before the technologies enter the market there is a significant number of steps which need to to be uh, addressed so it's uh, unfortunately it's a slow uh, pathway Professor Palacin, um, you have projected uh, these multivalent batteries as potentially very sustainable. Um, how do you actually make sure that um, all materials are more sustainable than um, the nowadays lithium ion technology? So um, as I understood, it's not really clear what materials are being used at both electrodes within these uh, frameworks. So how do you make sure that at the end you'll get something that is probably less sustainable than the batteries on the market right now. Yeah, well, now we are at the research level. So now our aim is to demonstrate the proof of concept. We, so we are essentially testing anything which we believe it could work. And if it has cobalt, okay, at the lab level, it is okay. Because now we are mostly focused on understanding the mechanism uh, to, to really know how to make the technology progress. But then it's, it's clear that if we go on and we need to commercialize this, we need to avoid the critical elements. So there are lists of critical elements uh, which are different depending on the region. So there is the, the list issued by the US, there is the European list, uh, now there is the UK list as well. Um, but so the idea is uh, to avoid the, the metals which are scarce. There are slight uh, differences between those lists because uh, each region may consider critical elements that they do not have in this region. So, But essentially, uh, cobalt comes from Africa, lithium comes from Australia, China, South America. So all those are elements which are not present in Europe. So ideally, one should use iron, manganese, Uh, as the main uh, components for the positive electrodes and, of course, calcium or magnesium as, as uh, the negative electrode. And we have seen uh, the eco 
uh, political dependencies within the last month. Nickel, for example, comes from Russia. And of course, Europeans want to make uh, ourselves a little more independent than it is right now. Last question, Professor Palacin, uh, where do you see multivalent batteries uh, in use in the future? Are there maybe first uh, batteries on the market even? No, there are, I mean, the only batteries on the market are the primary uh, zinc cells. Uh, and then for the rest uh, of metals, there is uh, nothing. Um, there are some, uh, not really batteries on the market, but thermal batteries used for military applications, uh, which are also primary because, of course, when missiles explode, uh, there is no need to recharge anything. But some, <laughs> some of them use uh, calcium or alloys which contain calcium as positive electrode, but this cannot be considered a practical application of these metals. So um, really, the, the, those batteries are not uh, in the market yet, and uh, they could be used in anything which is not require high power, so not requiring a fast charge or fast uh, discharge, but uh, something which requires a, a battery which is not very expensive, uh, so it could be great applications, so why not? So this could be used to store energy coming from renewable sources uh, and to release uh, this energy upon demand. That, that sounds like this could maybe even be an application for a home storage a battery. Maybe yeah. if I have my solar yeah. on my roof and I could use a multivalent battery because usually I don't have these high peaks. Absolutely, yeah. And then that, that could be interesting because those batteries as of now are pretty expensive. So it would be good to have a sustainable and, and, and potentially cheaper alternative on the horizon. So, uh, Professor Palacin, um, last, absolutely last question now for me. How many uh, researchers are active uh, worldwide on these multivalent batteries? Just to give us an idea, how many people are working on? Uh, well, the community is very small when compared, for instance, to lithium or, or, uh, or sodium uh, batteries. Uh, just... Uh, Yeah, to compare, maybe you have 10,000 papers published on lithium ion per year and uh, maybe uh, 10 times less for uh, sodium, I don't know, and uh, 100 times less for magnesium or calcium. But I would say that uh, maybe there are uh, 30 groups uh, worldwide, uh, smaller or bigger, that are working on these. There are European projects on these. And there is uh, even uh, now, since uh, I think it will be its fourth edition, uh, um, a workshop and a meeting on, on magnesium batteries, which is now uh, widened to multivalent concepts in, in Germany, in Ulm, trying to, to gather the, all this multivalent community to learn uh, from, from each other. So the community is indeed growing because the, 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 the concept is interesting, but we have also important challenges. So it's good to be able to integrate people with different complementary expertises which can contribute in, in solving the issues. Perfect last words. Thank you so much for your time and expertise, Professor Palacin. Dear listeners, now it's your turn. If you like, send us a mail. That's hello at batterygeneration.com if you want to see a specific topic covered in the future. And as always, hit the subscribe button and give us a five-star rating in Spotify, in Apple or Google. Our Twitter channels are Helmholtz Ulm or Celeste18. And for next time, click in, tune in and stay charged. <laughs>